My good family review is one that I'm not entirely sure about. I'm not entirely sure about how much I like it. With most things, I know exactly why I don't like them, but it was hard to put my finger on exactly why I didn't like The Good Family. The reasons that I gave, I still do agree with. The characters are all annoying. They're all clearly straw men, which doesn't usually work as a show premise. The abuse of Shay wasn't funny or interesting. And it was written by someone who, at the very least, didn't know where liberals were coming from. There was definitely awareness over some of the problems that liberal politics create, but there was no earnestness like with King of the Hill. The people only believed what they believed to look ridiculous and to be proven wrong. For a good counterpoint, look at Mr. Garrison in South Park seasons 19 and 20. He's there to look ridiculous and to be proven wrong, but he at least earnestly believes in what he's doing, and you can easily believe that. However, none of those things seem to be the exact reason that I didn't like The Good Family. I have to admit, this review came out of a place of intense frustration, but I wasn't entirely sure over frustration from what? It's easy to say that it was out of some crazy ideas from the left, as we've been seeing more and more in the recent years. And yes, that very well might have something to do with it. But I didn't think that that was the exact issue. And I tried tackling this further thoughts from that angle, and it always left me frustrated and annoyed and just not very fulfilled. Like, I wasn't talking about exactly what the problem was. And the problem is that this show isn't really a satire, at least not the first episode. It's an act of political prejudice. And this far into 2016, acts of political prejudice are continually turning my stomach. Just during this election, I have lost so much respect for so many people because of their behavior. And to get into the nitty gritty, we have to talk about some very dark recent events. As some people would say, let that be your trigger warning. We have all heard our parents say, you can't talk about this politician president unless you bash them in my house. Or alternatively, you're not allowed to criticize this politician. And we've all got this relative that we're uncomfortable talking with because they seem so far left or so far right. And growing up, it probably never seemed like much of a big deal. However, now, at least to me, it, it doesn't seem so innocuous. These smaller ideas, they've been leading up to darker and increasingly bad behaviors. It's very easy to see someone with a strong right-leaning opinion as some sort of traditionalist, racist, paranoid, oppressive bigot. It's just as easy to see someone with a strong left-leaning opinion as some sort of regressive, reductionist, communist, social justice warrior. And while those stereotypes do exist, not everyone falls neatly into those categories. But it's hard not to think that someone politically active falls into them, right? In 2016, it seems that people are more politically polarized than ever before. But that can't be right. Are we really more polarized than the 60s and the 70s? Seems doesn't always mean is. But it definitely seems like this is one of the most politically polarized times in history. One of the reasons for this political polarization is definitely social media. People are now able to say whatever they want, completely anonymously. And when you're able to do that, you feel more comfortable saying even more controversial opinions. On top of that, websites like Facebook give you the news that's least likely to actively piss you off, the stuff that you agree with. Most of these websites use algorithms. And the more that you think that people agree with you, the more comfortable that you'll be with your own opinions, and the more that you'll be willing to convey them, no matter how extreme they are. And with the birth of the internet, we now know all of the thoughts in existence. These thoughts were always around before, but no one could really hide if they spoke them, so they stayed locked in place. If you went on television or wrote a newspaper or yelled on the street, everyone could easily figure out who you were. At least somebody had to know. Let's talk seriously. The greatest battles of my generation, I feel that they won't be based on race or sex or even sexuality. At least, not directly. They're going to be battles of the left-right divide and battles of ideology. That may sound like a good thing on its face, like this is less of a prejudice. Political prejudice doesn't lead to slavery, and it doesn't directly lead to oppression. But it does lead to wars. It leads to cover-ups. It leads to rioting. And in worst case scenarios, it leads to the breakdown of democracy. Political polarization is actually the greatest weakness of democracy. Compromise makes democracy what it is. And if people become too polarized, then nothing will get done, at best. You know, until they all come to my way of thinking. Then we can move forward, slash, stop this country from going down the tubes. That's not democracy. What you're advocating for is a totalitarianism of your own opinion. If no one disagrees with you on literally every single matter, you do not live in a democracy. So that's probably the first thing you should be asking yourself. Do opposing opinions even exist? 
In my review, I said that I was a centrist. Of course, people accused me of being right-wing in disguise or something ridiculous like that. Unfortunately, I have to admit that I have been having more problems with the left than the right lately. In the 2000s, I had many more problems with the right, but in the 2010s, my biggest problems are with the left. This is because the right hasn't really been in power lately, at least before 2016. Like I said, right wing has become an insult, meaning backwards, redneck, intolerant, racist, bigoted, and aspiring to be a Nazi. And therein lies a problem. When you've convinced yourself that your enemy is Hitler, then as long as you're not committing the Holocaust, then you have the moral high ground when fighting them. And in turn, we get a lot of vigilantism from the left. Recently, a GOP building in North Carolina was firebombed. It's interesting how the anti-Nazis are drawing swastikas on other people's businesses that they destroyed. So tell me again, why do people think the horseshoe theory is bullshit? The anti-Nazis destroyed a building of someone they didn't like and drew a swastika on it. But it's just an isolated incident, right? It's not like this hasn't and won't happen again. You know, especially if the all my enemies are deplorable rhetoric keeps going on. Let's talk about the media. My least favorite kind of media, the mainstream media. Before this decade, it felt like anyone who talked smack about the mainstream media was a paranoid conspiracy nut. Sure, most news stations are and were biased, and they took no qualms in hiding it. But how the media has been behaving this election cycle is truly disgusting. And to be frank, it's scary. Like, I don't have anything against a news station backing a candidate. If they want Hillary to win, they can advocate for Hillary. If they want Trump to win, they can advocate for Trump. It's entirely within their rights to do so. They can give one candidate all positive publicity and another all negative publicity. That's normal and that's expected. Do you know what's not expected or okay by any stretch of the imagination? Lying! Outright lying! Earlier this week, a man who looks strikingly like Nicolas Cage went on CNN with a smug smile. He told people- Also interesting is remember, it's illegal to possess uh, these stolen documents. It's different for the media. So everything you learn about this, you're learning from us. And in full disclosure, let's take a look at what is in there and what it means. Joining us now, CN. Where do I even begin with this? It's not so much that it's a lie. It's how brazen and obvious that it is. It's not illegal to read WikiLeaks. It's illegal to leak government secrets, yes, but as long as you're not the one who leaked them, then you are most likely fine. I actually don't think that CNN really likes WikiLeaks all that much, because they cut off the satellite feed of someone who is about to talk about WikiLeaks. Hillary Clinton are coming out. The fact, through WikiLeaks, that she says one thing, uh, and... Oh no. All right, let's see if we can get Congressman Collins back. Obviously, we just lost the satellite feed. If it was an actual error, you'd think that the newscasters would have some stronger reaction. Oh no. All right, let's see if we can get Congressman Collins back. I'll that there'd be some lead up, some fuzzy images. And of course, we can't forget about CNN's selective edits during the Milwaukee riots. Has CNN always been deplorable, or was it just on this year's New Year's resolutions? But it's okay to lie to the public and to suppress information if we're on a mission to destroy Hitler, right? Whether you're pro-Clinton or pro-Trump or neither, this should scare the hell out of you. Because if they could do this to Trump, or with WikiLeaks or whatever, they could do it to anyone. Anyone can justify to themselves that this next person is going to start World War III, and we need to throw morality out to be moral. It's not so much that they're legally allowed to do this, which, if you're wondering, yes they are. It's that they're also willing to do this. And they wonder why only 32% of Americans trust the media. This is what political polarization does, not wanting to give the enemy a voice. But I can't talk about media hiding things and lying without talking about the Cologne New Year's Eve attacks in Germany. If you're wondering, this destroyed any faith I would ever have in political correctness being considered a good thing. I'll give you the brief. During the New Year's Eve celebrations at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, hundreds of sexual assaults, five rapes, and numerous thefts were reported in Germany. They were suspected to be migrants and asylum seekers, in a country that had been opening doors for more than the average amount of them. So, how did the media respond? The answer? At first, they didn't. And the mayor had an even better reaction. She called for a code of conduct for women, which included staying an arm's length away from strangers. Because it's great for social harmony to be afraid of people you don't know. She also called it completely improper to link these crimes to migrants. You know, the reason for all this victim blaming was to stop anti-immigration sentiment. Victim blaming. There's that horseshoe theory again. Did you ever hear the saying that the way to hell is paid with good intentions? Honestly, that might be my entire problem with the left. Everything I don't like usually boils down to that one saying. When people don't feel like they have a voice, they turn to extremism. By saying that anyone who wants to have any immigration reform or doesn't feel safe with open borders is an abject racist, and saying that they're at least as awful as the acts of those assaulting women, you 
in a way, give them permission to be. Whenever someone calls a politician or somebody a Nazi or Hitler and they're not those things, the best response is always, so, what are you going to call them when they actually start advocating for genocide? The news media in Europe only started covering the clone attacks when it proved to be inevitable, due to social media outrage. And yes, they scapegoated the concern on racism. Let's actually talk about what prejudice is. Or very least, where it comes from. Prejudice comes more from fear than from anger. Without fear, you cannot have prejudice. Fear is the seeds and anger is the soil. Even in sentiments like, they're gonna steal our jobs, or they're gonna blow us up, they have more roots in fear than outright anger. It's a rational fear, but it's fear nonetheless. And do you know what really builds up fear? Oh, I don't know, the media hiding the attacks, the government's ignoring it, and people trying to silence their voice, people feeling that they won't get justice if they end up being the victim of a minority. But it's okay, because we're stopping racism, right? This is why I keep advocating against internet censorship. It is something that we absolutely cannot allow. If we censor the internet, it will be one of the biggest stifling of human progress in history. There have been rumors that Facebook has been censoring conservative views. Apparently Twitter shadow banned Scott Adams, the cartoonist responsible for Dilbert. And you can read the full story here. Twitter has always been known to silence conservative voices. I mean, most of their trust and safety council is liberal. And let's turn to Reddit. Here are two of my favorite subreddits. R undelete and R reddit minus mods. And then there's the big YouTube demonetization project. There has been speculation that it's more likely to demonetize smack talk against one candidate more than the other. But it's okay, because we're stopping cyberbullying, right? So earlier this year, England voted to leave the European Union. In this event called Brexit, it was so big that we heard about it over here in the United States, where it seems like there's only two countries, United States and not United States. I hear that that was a close election too, almost 50-50. And since people couldn't really say that half of their country was racist, even though, once again, most people thought that only racists would vote to leave. Do you see yet why saying Trump is a racist hasn't stopped him? They needed a new scapegoat. Old people! What happened was that older people turned out the most to vote. And some astute young people took notice of that. Some of them who didn't even vote. So Twitter, of course it was Twitter, lit up with people complaining about this. Some even going as far to say is that they should have a maximum age on voting. Because those that disagree with you shouldn't have a vote. That's how democracy works, right? The funny part is that as long as older people keep voting more than younger people, as they always have and they always will, you're not going to get that reform. Also, anyone who argues for the disenfranchisement of any demographic is not only a massive fucking moron, but absolutely morally reprehensible. One thing that bothers me the most is that everything has been put on a moral pedestal. If you don't want gun control, you're quote unquote letting toddlers kill their families and commit suicide. Hillary, I I'd really like some evidence on that one. Can we get PolitiFact on the line? If you talk down this social program, you're a bigot. If you don't think the minimum wage should be raised, you're trotting on the poor. If you talk positively about immigration reform, you're a racist. Ignoring those issues themselves, maybe there'll be a time, but there's none here. This is something that needs to stop, because it is the biggest cause of this divide. As I said in the beginning, if you can convince yourself that your opponent is a terrible person, there's almost nothing that you can't justify doing to them. And when you end up doing those things, they will have that same brand of logic and react accordingly. 2016 has been a tumultuous year, and we have at least one major political event left. I say at least because there's bound to be more. I'm worried about the fallout, in either direction, no matter who gets elected. People are not going to be happy, and they're going to react accordingly, no matter who gets elected. I fear that we haven't yet seen the fullest extent of what political prejudice is going to do to our population and our generation. But it's already set its course to be a major player, and that's going to be something that we need to deal with. We need to try and get back to the middle, and that can only happen by listening. While it's easy to believe that everything the other side has to say is regressive or racist, by not having an active conversation, it only dooms these very people we despise to walk further and further down these pathways and create a cycle that is increasingly difficult to break. So, what's the answer? Maybe Casey Neistat was right about one thing. We need to open up and talk about this, and be open about our political beliefs. We need to start seeing the other side. Remember, prejudice of any kind comes from fear and anger, and fear comes from the unknown. The more that we know and understand the other side, the less afraid we're able to be. Otherwise, the future doesn't look so good. Everything that I mentioned, and much, much more, happened this year. This year alone. And unless we start having open discussions and stop stifling others, these problems will continue, and get worse. 
People will continue to let atrocities slide by as to not give political opponents power. That's a, that's a trend that I've noticed a lot. The media will continue to lie. There will be more vandalism, more assault, and more hatred. And yes, there will be more people advocating for the removal of democracy because it allows opposing opinions. Here's to a better 2017.